to yet another episode of the Youth Cafe podcast. I'm your host, Shali Jemeli. Just the other day, Mr. President said, uh, once he's done with politics, he'll get back to evangelism. And in contrast, our guests today have been on a mission since day one, and that is uh, spreading the word on civic education. Uh, there's no pulpit required, just empowering citizens to understand their rights and take meaningful action. Today's episode is all about civic education. Um, Karibuni sana, please tell us who you are, where you're from, and what you do, and any other information you'd like us to know about you. Um, I can go. My name is Momburi Benjamin. Um, I come from Taita Taveta, but currently residing in Nairobi. I'm a lawyer by training. Um, I um, work in different spaces, but my day-to-day is at Mzalendo Trust, which is a parliamentary monitoring organization. Otherwise, I volunteer <coughs> at Taifa Teule um, Leadership um, Network and uh, assist a program called Shiriki which is a space we've basically curated for youth to engage on social, political, and economic issues on a monthly basis. So yes, that is me in a nutshell. Shukran. Uh, thank you very much, Shelly, uh, for having us here. Uh, first of all, I must commend the good work that you guys are doing. Creating these spaces is such a noble idea because young people need their space to articulate about their issues. Uh, my name is Mike Omboro. I'm the executive director of Bunge Mashinani. And Bunge Mashinani is basically about organizing communities. For far too long, it has been about mobilizing communities along tribal lines, along political affiliations and all that. But now we believe that we need to organize our communities so that they can take advantage of the, of the promise of devolution as articulated in the, in the constitution that we gave ourselves. So our work basically revolves around civic education and telling people their role not just their rights, their rights and responsibilities when it comes to governance, where they need to go for public participation, where they need to be at the center of decision making. And that is what we have committed to do as our contribution to the growth of this nation that we love so much called Kenya. And thank you for having us. Wow, you're welcome. Um, so before we get even to knowing what civic education is, um, on a scale of 1 to 10, uh, how would you rate the current level of civic education in Kenya? Um, I'm going to rate it at 4. And it is, not, mm-hmm. and it is not based on hot air. <laughs> it is actually based on a research that we did mm-hmm. under the Kenya Devolution CSO's working group mm-hmm. when we did a survey on devolution at 10. Mm-hmm. And we realized people simply do not know their their responsibilities when it comes to devolution. Mm -hmm. People are still in the old dispensation where the political leaders or the politicians were seen as, you know, they are the ones who, when they say jump in terms of uh, participation, we say how high. Mm -hmm. So in terms of awareness, citizens, citizen uh, citizen knowledge on devo- pro- processes in their rights and responsibilities I'll give it a week for uh, how about you Buru? Um, now I won't pick my mm-hmm. rating on research um, mm-hmm. as him because then I want to look at it on a national scale mm-hmm. um, I'd give it a three or there about um, mm-hmm. but I think the recent robust engagement that we've seen especially from the youth, um, gives us hope of it going high. Um, and I think, yeah, that, that is the trajectory that we're going um, from um, onwards. So hoping that it doesn't die down, hoping that there is still robust civic engagement, especially heading to the 2027 general elections. I'm hoping there's a better understanding of political processes um, as we go on. Um, and yeah, hoping it increases. But at the moment, I still think there's a lot of work to be done. Mm, yeah. So for now, we can just only hope. Yeah. 
Okay. <laughs> um, so now let's uh, get to understand uh, what is civic education and maybe why is it important for young people to get educated? I think civic education, as the, as the word suggests, is civic mm. and education. We all know what education is. So, mm. uh, civic. To my layman's language. To my CBC in a primo. Yeah. But now, when we talk about civic education, mm-hmm. it is about what are these things that you, as a responsible and active citizen, should be, should be knowing so that you become an active citizen. It, it starts, it boils all the way from elections, from governance processes, from your responsibilities, to how you, you, you are supposed to be a patriotic Kenyan. All that is civic education. And unfortunately, the young people have not benefited from civic education from the start. Because for us who are a bit older, the millennials and the older generations, civic education started from, from primary school. Tulikuwa tunafanya kitu ilikuwa inaitwa GHC, Geography, History and Civics. The C, the civics part of it, is what was telling us what our national colors are, why we should be patriotic Kenyans, why we should love our country, why we should, you know, that civic education started from there. But the moment GHC was removed from the curriculum, um, the current generation is struggling to find their space as citizens. Wasn't that incorporated in social studies? Uh, in social studies, if you look at social studies, it's mainly talking about, you know, things that are happening in the continent, things that are ha- happened in history, prehistory. For us, we were talking, we could name all the ministers by name. Hmm. We could tell who was the first president, the first vice president and all that. And it instilled a level of civic awareness. And that is why uh, most of us young people, most of us who are not as young as the Gen Zs, are able to tell how our history has been. And we appreciate the, the events of history in terms of, uh, in, in terms of uh, shaping our future as a country. Mm-hmm. So civic education is basically kusoma tu mambo ya inchi na kujua how you are supposed to behave as a, mm-hmm. as a citizen. Umesema <laughs> ikwe kwa fingertips. Yes, like Asha this. Asha tukia mshua 1 a.m. Tunaeza sema. Uh, so, Mburu, why do you think it's important for young people to get educated? Mumburi. Um, oh, Mumburi. Yeah. Um, I, I think I'll, I'll use what he said as a backdrop. Mm. Um, so, civic education is education of the masses on political processes and all. Um, why is it important? Um, I, from even what um, Bertolt Brecht, um, he's the author of the Caucasian Joke Circle, if you went to school in my generation, we did that. Uh, Bertolt says, people do not know. I am paraphrasing what he said, but he said, people do not know that disinterest in politics is not an option. Um, that it is the politics that controls the price of the fish, the price of the milk, and every other thing. Mm. So then, unless you understand the direct correlation of gov- government, governance processes, structures... Uh, political structures and involvement in those in your day-to-day life, then you never see the interlink. And so that brings us to where we are right now because we are complaining about um, economic uh, regression, we are complaining about lack of opportunities, but then we don't want to take responsibility for the fact that that is directly correlated with the leaders that we have in place. So then the importance of civic education is one empowerment Mm -hmm. because then young people are empowered enough to hold their leaders accountable. You can only hold your leaders accountable from a point of information. You can only tell them, um, you promised us 300,000 jobs, you have given us 10,000, this is the gap. Um, So apart from empowerment, which we are seeing with the current generation, um, because then they are able to understand the policies and laws that are being put in place, um, there is also the erosion of apathy um, because then you get to understand that civic education um, directly relates to political processes um, because then I am able to have knowledge um, on politics and all. Um, you can't afford to be apathetic to political processes once you understand that. Mm-hmm. So you show up to vote because you know the leaders they put in place will... Um, put in policies which will directly impact my life 
Um, we also, civic education is facilitative um, to public participation. It is something that allows us to have meaningful public participation. So then, once there is enough civic education, we are able to enhance the level of public participation that we have, whether it is submitting our views on various memoranda and bills, we are doing that from a point of um, information. So yes, that is what I would say is the importance of civic education, especially um, for the younger generation. Mm. Yeah. Um, so Mr. Mburu, you've said that uh, civic education is about kujua, kujua what's going on. Uh, could you maybe mention the components, major, major components of civic education? <coughs> Yeah, um, I may not be as uh, learned as my friend who is a lawyer here, but I will attempt. <laughs> <laughs> uh, when you look at civic education, and I'm looking at it purely from a citizen perspective, what do I need to know from, citizen, from, pub, uh, from civic education? Mm -hmm. Number one is political processes. How, does, how do I as a citizen fit into bringing leaders into office? That to, uh, to citizens is quite important. And number two is about how do you influence policies. At the end of the day, when we give government a mandate, when we elect uh, leaders to those offices, we are giving, the, we are actually donating, the constitution uses the word donating power to them. Because Article 1 simply says all power belongs to the people. So if we donate power to you, we can uh, as well take, his, take it back. And so as citizens, we are supposed to know through civic education, when we give you this power, how are you supposed to exercise that power? What are your limits? Where, up until where can you not cross the line? So civic education is mainly about uh, governance processes. It's about influencing policy. It's about political processes. It's about how government is run. It's about, it's about how government plans, it's about how government budgets, all those are just components of civic education. And civic education is one broad area. Mm. Okay. So, Mr. Mamburi, um, are there any misconceptions that you know of about civic education? Yeah, um, one thing is people use civic education and public participation interchangeably, which is not the case. <laughs> Um, civic education and public participation, albeit correlated, um, are not similar. In the sense that civic education is the initial bit, it is what would facilitate public participation. So civic education is us getting informed, us getting educated um, about our rights, um, our responsibilities, how political processes and democratic institutions work, and so on and so forth. But public participation is now our active involvement and engagement in influencing policies, especially in the context of our constitution. So that is one of the biggest misconception. The second is that civic education is a preserve of the civil society in Kenya, which is not the case. Um, it is our civic duty. It is my civic duty as Mwamburi to um, educate my peers to educate my siblings my village mates about what i know and it is their duty to um, do the same because then we exist in different spaces some um, engineers some are in the informal sector teachers and whatnot and we can't all know what is happening around all sectors at once so it is a civic duty that is a preserve of everyone by virtue of being a citizen of this country um, civic education also can and should be done by government and government institutions. So then, if IEBC knows we are headed to the election, what are they doing to educate the masses about the electoral process? What are they doing to, educate, to demystify the myths surrounding electoral processes? So then different institutions have different um, duties that accrue to them, um, in terms of civic education, it is not a preserve of the civil society um, and it is different from public participation but interlinked. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, maybe I would want to agree with what you have said and add probably two, two more perceptions we've seen and misconceptions about civic education. And what I would consider big, and it is where 
fights between government and civil society has been is that anyone who is seen rolling out civic education is seen to be opposing government is seen to be uh, <laughs> inviting trouble for for governments so when you come and educate citizens to for them to demand their rights you know you are seen as a as an enemy of the state and i, I and i would really want to to talk directly to governments <laughs> That when we do civic education, as Mwamburi has said, this is your responsibility. Uh, Section 100 of the County Government Act specifically says the work uh, of civic education is entirely for the county government. And when they do not perform that function, for obvious reasons, for obvious reasons, nobody wants to lead an educated citizenry. Everybody wants to lead people who say yes, 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 clap, clap, clap. Mm -hmm. Which and as civil society, we are going to raise our voices and say, don't clap, clap, clap because of development, because it is your rights. So when we educate citizens, it should not be seen like we are awakening citizens against government. They should actually government should actually see as us helping them for citizens to understand. If you are an MCA, once a citizens are educated, they will not ask you about national government functions. Mm -hmm. They will not ask you about uh, a police station when you are an MCA. When you are an MP, they will not ask you about an ECD. Mm -hmm. Now that makes your work much easier. Mm -hmm. So if they are able to see it objectively, mm -hmm. it becomes very easy. Mm -hmm. The second thing is about uh, political processes. Mm -hmm. uh, if you ask any Kenyan, they'll think IEBC only exists to deliver elections. <laughs> and we see the green for IEBC two, three months to an election. Mm -hmm. But IEBC is a constitutional commission that is there throughout. And one of the biggest things that you should be doing is civic education. Mm -hmm. But to IEBC, I think civic education to IEBC is how to mark a ballot. That unaweka hiyo kitu, unaambiwa unaweka hapo, ama X, na hiyo mkia isitoke. I mean, that is anybody. Can, anybody can know that in two or three seconds. It should move from how to mark a ballot to mm -hmm. who you should mark that ballot too. Mm -hmm. In terms of, you know, telling citizens who is a good leader. Mm -hmm. What are the qualities that you should be looking at mm -hmm. when you are looking at good uh, leaders. Mm -hmm. The other thing is about uh, the, funding, the funding of civic education. Mm -hmm. By the virtue that it is a government function, a county government function, it is the responsibility for county governments to fund civic education. Mm -hmm. And if you scan around, I only think it is Makweni that has a budget for civic education. All the other counties have said no. In Kiambu, we did a petition, we mobilized people, we went for Maandamano, and we were demanding 1% of civic of the county budget to go to civic education. We are trying to live within our means. <laughs> no, but uh, mm. living with, uh, within our means, does, I, I think I would rather educate the people of Kiambu than build a governor's office. No. or a governor's residence for that matter. Mm -hmm. It is more priority to educate the citizens mm -hmm. than you know, some of these things which we don't feel are priorities because like the governor doesn't mean that he sleeps outside today. Yeah, yeah. And mm -hmm. So his, his residential palace is not a priority. Mm -hmm. So when you look at the push we have been giving, mm -hmm. we, we went there, we took to the county assembly, we told them in this budget, pass 1% of the budget for every 100 shillings just reserve one shilling in the budget for educating the citizens mm -hmm. it is work in progress uh, it has not yet seen the light of day but we will continue pushing because mm -hmm. it is important civil society cannot have all the responsibility of doing civic education and there is no single donor who would have so much money to give us than the, the kind of money that is in the county government budgets so we should be actually looking at that resource to do the work it's supposed to do. Mm -hmm. Okay, so speaking of <clears throat> funds, uh, just the other day, Eric Omondi, Alikwana Sema Venye, we should, um, what do you call, we should minimize the number of offices. Kama, let's say MPs, we reduce, we reduce the number of governors, the number of nini. So what's your opinion on that? Um, that's a very sentimental question for Kenyans mm -hmm. because we are struggling with wage bills. We are struggling with, uh, you know, as you said, living within our means. 
But if there is something that we can do for austerity, mm-hmm. I don't see wh- why we need so many MPs to represent us. First of all, I'm in the school of thought that uh, we do not need the legislative arm of government. Mm. We can do with the executive arm mm. and we can do with the judiciary and that is it. Because these people are supposed to be there to do representation. Mm-hmm. But history has shown us that they do not represent us. Look at the finance bill. We all said we do not want finance bill. They went and passed the finance bill. So how are they representing us? So it's not about trimming. I think there should be, uh, we should shake the table and say that government is about delivering services and providing justice. Mm-hmm. Service delivery is a, is a reserve of the executive. Uh, uh, defending the constitution and upholding justice is the work of judiciary. So representation, we can represent ourselves. Article 1 says we can represent ourselves directly. Okay. So we should work in, I think we should now be thinking along the lines of how do we represent ourselves? <laughs> because even when we send them, they don't represent us. Okay. So you're saying we disband parliament yes, and send them all of them to home. go home. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay. Um, now that you've been in this civic space for quite some time, uh, what are the major challenges that you face, especially on matters civic education? Um, civic education. I think the major challenges that are faced are one, um, disengagement. Yeah. So especially um, before the finance bill protest and what we saw later on as you know robust c- uh, citizen engagement. Um, before then, there was a lot of apathy. People were so disengaged and dis- disinterested um, with government processes and structures and every other thing. That comes from mistrust in government because people knew whether I know or not, whether I vote or not, nothing changes. Mm. We still recycle the same leaders who will not represent my views. So why should I vote? Why should I know which laws are being passed? And when I submit a memorandum on a bill, it is not taken into consideration. So then you'd call for civic education, whether online or um, physically on the ground and very few people would show up um, and with time then you realize you're already preaching to the converted yeah um, it is what Jesus said um, mm-hmm. now that we're talking about evangelism <laughs> mm-hmm. that he came to serve and to seek what was lost he didn't come to preach to those who are already um, following you know the word of the Lord but now coming back to civic education Yes, you realize it is the same 30 people who show up every time. Mm. Um, people are not engaged, so it was a huge challenge. There's a bit of shift now, um, but we hope to see it better. Um, another challenge is, of course, um, <laughs> finances. Um, the envisioning of devolution was that also civic education, as he's mentioned, would trickle down to county governments. And actually, 3% of county government budgets should go to public participation and civic mm-hmm. education. That is not the case. So then you call for, for people to show up to discuss certain issues. You don't have a venue to begin with. You can't even give water to, to Mwananchi. Um, even when they carry their water, there is no shed. And it is the tiniest of things cannot even be taken care of. Um, then there is a shift in technology also affects civic education directly and indirectly. We are moving from a space where physical interactions were compulsory and people had to show up for things to move. But now people are in their homes. Um, so they show up through the phone, they show up virtually or physically. And so there is need for even civic education to move um, to accommodate technological shifts. But with that also comes a cost. Um, also comes civic education of civic education. Informing people, we are meeting on Zoom, but how do you use Zoom? Yeah. Um, now taking uh, people through Zoom, especially the older generations, because then my grandfather um, and the age of our parents are used to newspaper. But now you're telling them, no, there is an e paper that you can read. Now you're telling them, oh, Hatuendi um, kwa chief um, tunataka mtumie Zoom. So then you need to explain such things. So that um, also directly impacts civic education in one way um, or the other. 
Um, the last challenge that I'd mentioned to, um, in regards to civic education is we have a really bad culture of expectation of money because then there is not an understanding of it is my civic duty um, to know the laws, to know political processes, to hold my leaders accountable. Anytime you call people um, for civic education or anytime you intend to educate the masses, they expect you to give them money. Um, and you can't always do that. As, as a young person, if I decide to uh, talk to my village mates and tell them about what we should push for in our county in Taita, I don't have the money to give you. It is your civic duty. Um, so there is that and it is a really huge challenge right now. But then you can't entirely blame the masses because it is a culture that is as a result of economic marginalization. These people don't have money. You're telling me, nifunge biashara angu nikuje for three hours to zungumze. Here three hours, um, I would have earned 300, 400 shillings. So then it's, it's, it's a balance of priorities. So those, I'd say, are the major challenges that we're currently facing, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I want to pick up from where my learned friend has talked about, about, uh, you know, feeling that you cannot close your business to go for public participation. While I agree with him, I think the, the bigger question should be, what is this that can make somebody to close their business to go for civic education? Uh, that, uh, that always comes up in the community, and that's why I totally agree. But the question we always ask people is, if today you, if you are a parent, you get an SMS in the evening, and you're told tomorrow there's a very urgent meeting for the school, for the form force, and you have to show up at nine, and uh, it is compulsory for all, for all parents. You utafunga everything you had for the following day so that you make sure that you're in that school at nine. So what is that that will make you have that duty and responsibility to go to that school? I don't know what it is, but what it is, is what should be making us feel that responsibility to go for civic education when it is called. People are actually going out of their way, like Mwamburi has said, to deliver civic education, to share this knowledge with other people. What I know, I call my friends, my village mates, my people in the world to tell them what I know. But what is this, what is the value proposition for civic education? What is this that people will feel, I really need to go to Mwamburi to hear what he's saying? That is what has been lacking. And we need to arouse this need for citizens to know that it is not just about their rights. We are very keen, and I'm in civil society, and people are very keen on their rights, but they forget the second component, which is their responsibilities. Public participation is a responsibility. Government has a, has a responsibility also to prepare a hall, blah, blah, blah. But it is now the responsibility of citizens to come. And if they don't come, whoever will be in that hall, they'll just say we passed. And that becomes a decision that affects everyone. So I, I, I agree with you. Uh, second thing that is quite a challenge is access to information. If you look at Article 35 of the Constitution, it, it, it is so rich in terms of citizens being able to get access to information, public information in any public office, apart from a few, you know, uh, a, a few information that is limited, you know, things like medical records, military, all those things. Actually, we even don't need them. But when we are talking about county budgets, when we are talking about uh, all the projects that are being done in a community, when we are talking about all these, they are in the public domain. And guess what? You should even not be asking for them. There is, the element, there is the principle of uh, proactive disclosure. Yeah. If I am a duty bearer, it is, I'm not supposed to wait for Shirley to come to my office to request for information. I should be disclosing that information. So it has been a big challenge, but with a lot of work from civil society, from media, from organizations, we are seeing a lot of improvement. If you go to any website, you will find the controller of budget reports are there, Auditor General's reports are there, but counties are still very naughty when it comes to <laughs> giving information. <laughs> they are supposed to tell us after every three months, mm -hmm. they are supposed to publish a report of what they have been doing, mm -hmm. the implementation reports. Uh, I don't know the numbers, but if there is any county doing that, I doubt. Mm -hmm. So access to information is becoming such a, such a big concern. 
The other one is, you know, when you talk about public participation, and I'm saying this in the context of once we do civic education, we expect action. And to me, the action that comes after civic education is now people having the appetite to go to those public participation spaces. If you look at our public participation, it's not so appealing to the young people. When you are telling them to go to a, to a hall, Kwanzaa, I don't know, there's something about young people now is a chief. Don't call them there. <laughs> they will not come. I don't know. And, we, and I think we need to demystify <laughs> the office of the chief. Mm. So when you call them to these spaces, mm. they will not go there. Mm. But unfortunately, the decisions that are going to be passed, they are going to affect them. Mm. So for us, we are looking at improving how to make public, public participation, uh, participation sexier for the young people. Mm. And we are going into their spaces. Mm. And the youth spaces are number one, music. If you, if you saw the maandamanos there, yeah. after maandamano, and you see, you could see how it was so ectating for the young people for that dance. Mm -hmm. And number two is social media. Mm. So for us as Bunge Machinani, what we are doing is we have developed a program where we will be going in every last Sunday mm -hmm. for public participation through music concerts. And it is not in a hall, Nikwa Street. Apo kwa hiyo town, we put in very heavy music, 90% will be dancing. But within this 90%, this 10%, the content you are going to deliver in terms of civic education, I can guarantee you, is going to reach to the right people. And then once they are there, unawambia tu a post where they are on TikTok or wherever, and talk about what they are learning. You see, for us, we are seeing this as an easier way of bringing civic education closer to the people, and uh, it's a concept that we are trying, and we want all hands on deck. This is not a reserve for one organization. Mm. All of us should be trying in, a, in our best ways to see how we can be able to deliver civic education. And the last one is funding. Mm. Uh, civic education is a, co is a cost. And that is why there is even a proposal in, in Senate on the County Civic Education Bill of 2024 that says that every county by law should actually put aside some money for civic education. We are calling upon the senators to please pass that bill so that it now becomes easier for our people to be educated once the resources are set aside. Uh, speaking of digital divide, uh, we have the marginalized communities. Um, now, what are some of the practical ways that can be used to make civil education, civic education accessible to them? Yeah. When you talk about marginalized communities, does that include including the PWDs or we are talking about ethnic uh, marginalized communities? Plus the PWDs. Yeah, okay. Uh, it is... It is actually our responsibility as the practitioners who are in this space to make sure that civic education is accessible to everyone mm. because it is not a reserve for us who are, you know, fully able-bodied. Mm -hmm. If somebody is not in a position or has some visual impairment, you know, we need to make civic education also accessible to them because we cannot move a country while leaving some people behind. So in terms of uh, the device, assistive devices that should help, if it is in Braille, and there is nothing that also prevents us from doing uh, manuals and uh, you know civic education posters in local languages. Because there are so many people who do not understand this English and Kiswahili that we are talking about. But I mean, this English just the other day. Me, I did not go very far in school. So there, there are those people who do not know English, do not know Kiswahili. And it should not be seen like not knowing a foreign language is being silly. Far from it. Actually, people who do not know English are very sharp. Yeah. And uh, research has shown that mm. people who, who are able even to articulate in Kikuyu, go and talk to our Mze in Maasai land, in, in Kamba, when they are delivering a point in their native language, you can feel that wisdom mm. and you can feel the points that they are trying to bring across. Mm -hmm. Let us translate these materials to their languages so that they can also, pro they can also pass that, uh, this information in a language that people understand without looking down on them that they are not able to speak these languages that we speak that are foreign. Mm -hmm. English is not a measure of intelligence. No, it is not. <laughs> okay. Mm -hmm. 
Um, yeah, just picking up from where he's left, I'm looking at marginalized groups in terms of youth, um, women, I um, mean PWDs. Um, with youth, of course, leveraging technology would be the easiest way to get civic education to them. But then it depends with, we look at youth um, from the lenses of the urban and peri-urban youth. We forget there's also a youth um, Kijijini. But the level of our internet penetration in the country uh, makes it easier to still reach to them. But I'm looking at persons with disabilities. We have Senator Crystal Lasige, who continuously complains about not having access to committee reports in parliament, and she's a senator. Mm. You can imagine now um, the other um, persons with disabilities in our communities. If a whole senator cannot access committee reports and other parliamentary documents, what about the other um, persons with disabilities that we have in our communities? Do we have audio versions of our budgets? Do we have audio versions of um, our audit reports? Do we have any bill in the country that is in an audio version? We don't. Um, do we have sign language interpretation videos of bills and these documents? We don't. And see, this only um, exacerbates their marginalization <coughs> because now they don't have access and they are not informed of what is going on. Yet we call ourselves an inclusive community. Um, I'm also looking at it from the specs of minority groups um, and communities. Watu, Wako, Shago, how do we um, reach to them? And that is why there should always be a budget of civic education and public participation. Because apart from these translations to make this information accessible to everyone, um, how then does this information cascade to the last person? I've seen civic education and public participation take place in churches. Yes. Um, so um, it is being announced in church that today after the service at 2, um, jumuiya hi na jumuiya hi na jumuiya hi, they will be discussing this, kuna sheria, na zungumzia, hi na hi na hi. And we see it is important as a, as a church to discuss this and submit it to the county or to the national government. So there is a lot to be done in terms of making civic education um, accessible to both minority groups and marginalized groups in our country. Mm -hmm. Nice. Yeah. Um, maybe, maybe you would allow me to disagree a bit with the, with the, with my my worthy uh, panelists here, mm -hmm. and I want your protection. Mm -hmm. When he says that young people are marginalized, mm -hmm. that is one thing I will never agree with anybody in this country. Why? Uh, of course, you've taken sides, <laughs> <laughs> and I, I know we are in the youth cafe. Mm -hmm. uh, there is no way. A population that is the most populous in terms of uh, in terms of numbers, mm -hmm. most educated, most tech survey, most uh, exposed. There is no way you can tell me that young people in this country are marginalized because this victim mentality, and I'm talking to young people. This victim mentality of young people must end. We have all it takes, and I'm saying we because I'm almost I'm in that. No, I mm. that, I mean that in the thin line between old and... Uh, well, now, the next. <laughs> mm. So I have been a youth representative mm. for this country in the Commonwealth. Mm -hmm. And that is a line that we used to pull for a very long time. Mm -hmm. hey, youth, you know, we don't have our space. When governments are meeting, when the presidents are meeting, young people are only called to come and dance for them. We want our space. And we were, we were asked, mm. what is this that young people keep saying that we are marginalized? We have, if it is about political leadership, if young people decided they will vote for candidate X, believe you me, in the morning that candidate will be voted in. Mm. If young people said they want to transform civic education through social media, they have shown us they have the capacity. Young people have managed to achieve what civil society, what uh, you know, NGO agencies, what UN agencies have tried over the decades in less than two weeks. And that is making sure that the voices of people are heard in the finance bill. I was listening to young people and they, most of them thought that finance bill is a new concept. It's something that came this year with Ruto. But finance bill has been there 
since time immemorial because this is the revenue side of government of the budget mm -hmm. but it is only this time when young people have realized what a finance bill is and its implication they've been able to stop it not even just influencing it for us we have always been saying we need our voices heard in the finance bill nothing this year it was rejected in totality so young people have been put with this mentality that they are marginalized unfortunately young people have fallen into that trap of feeling they are marginalized so much so that they that the young people are even given a sijui youth fund sijui agpo i mean young people cannot be categorized with ethnic minorities like the ogiek young people cannot be be, be put in the same uh, in the same basket with the pwds young people have what it takes to change this country and uh, for purposes of these discussions we should not be saying that young people are marginalized young people have all it takes mm. Mm. i i will i will. do we have a helmet here because <laughs> i need some protection yeah. um, i i have the right to respond um but yeah um i agree with him to to a good extent and um, have a dissenting opinion on some other things Um, so one, there's a difference between majority and minority groups and marginalized groups. Um, and yeah, we are the majority. Mm -hmm. Millennials and Gen Zs alone form 55.47% of our population. Um, 75% of the electorate can be young people if we register to vote. And that is a lot of power. And that show of power was seen in the recent months, yeah? because then we were able to influence one or two things but then when you speak of marginalization there are layers to it there is social marginalization there is political marginalization and there is economic marginalization in this government in as much as we say we should form we are 75% we are 55 point something percent of the population less than 30% of government positions are occupied by young people not that young people are not qualified we are properly qualified we have access to information the most brilliant generation mm -hmm. is the young but they are not given jobs what does that lead to it leads to economic marginalization and economic marginalization directly leads to political marginalization why for i for me to vie for a political seat i will need money for my campaigns Who am I vying against? I'm vying against Mburu, who is now occupying a government position, yeah? who now has money. I, I cannot match um, to the economic strength that he will wield. Mind you, <laughs> yeah, mind you um, there is also a level of social marginalization. Hata kwa vijiji, tutambiwa o committee imefomiwa na nini na nini, ni nani atakuwa kwa hiyo committee? You think it is the 18, 24, 27, 33 year old. Na na and then they say we are And then they say we are not marginalized. We are. It is just that there are layers of marginalization. And in as much as we still have a lot of power, these layers still exist. Ndio maana 2027 ikifika um, because we don't have jobs, we have been denied jobs. The rate of unemployment is still increasing in the country. Uh, we are being shipped abroad um, to go work as maids Literally. and mechanics and, and what not. A politician who has money and the economic arsenal will come give me 200 shillings and I will vote for him because of desperation, because I don't understand the power that I wield. Why? Because of economic and social marginalization, which now leads to political marginalization. We are the majority we can change things but we are marginalized to an extent and what i also want people to understand is that unlike for pwds for women and youth marginalization can be a temporary state we cannot forever be marginalized but if they are well empowered if we change the leaders that we have um, the level of economic viability for young people etc then we have young people empowered they move from that bracket women are the same currently in as much as this you know education is more accessible to women and in, we still 
cannot block our eyes from the fact that there are still layers of marginalization. There are still things that they face that the 40, 50 year old man does not face. So are we the majority? Yes. Are we marginalized? Yes. Can this change? Yes. <laughs> so then why, why, then why are the youth not changing it? If, if you have agreed, mm. and uh, I like the way Mwamburi is articulate because he's a lawyer. And you know a lawyer will convince you anything, move your position from here to here effortlessly. Yeah. But Mwamburi, what is this? If young people feel they have the numbers, they have all that you have said, what is this then temporary uh, level of marginalization that still exists? From time immemorial, in all the generations, we have always been talking about youth marginalization. So if we are talking about political space, if you are telling me that young people cannot convince their fellow young people to vote for them and they do not have the money, then the young people are having a problem. It should be that for us, we are saying as young people, we know these are our fellow young people, our young person. We know that he does not have the economic opportunities like that other person. And it is for that reason that we are going to vote this person because he understands our issues, he understands where we are coming from, he knows he also doesn't have, and we are voting for him knowing that he does not have, and we bring these people into positions. When we say we, we want change, and ask any Kenyan right now, they will say we need change in this country. Saying that you want change is one thing. We can come to uh, this youth cafe, Natupate Shali Apa, Na tuambie ule mtu anatupikianga huku leo hakukuja job, laki tunataka kukula chapu. Anaingia kwa hiyo kitchen yao, if the kitchenette I've seen down here. Anaona kuna unga, kuna mafuta, kuna ile pan, ile ya kufanya hivi pancake. So saying we want to eat chapati is one thing. But before that chapati becomes chapati and comes on the table, is a whole work. So the young people want change, but they do not want to, to walk the talk and make sure that they bring that change. But I want to give the young people the benefit of doubt. From the Gen Z movement, it is so inspiring that young people have shown they can actually be that change. And I pray that this, this euphoria is still going to be there until 2027, where that spirit of change, you know, young people are saying, it's our country we are fighting for. It is not those positions. That's why we are saying we are leaderless, we are tribeless. We don't want those positions of yours. As we want to save our country, we want accountability. We want government to function the way it's supposed to be doing. If that is the spirit that is going to be there in 2027, believe you in the next five years, Kenya will be a transformed country. Because Kenya, we do not have a problem of money. We have a problem of corruption. If only the young people put in structures and avenues and policies through their influence to make sure that they are tackling corruption and an accounted public debt and all that, this country will change for the better. But next year, 2027, tunakutana muamburi kwa campaign trail, amepanga apewe 200, that will, be the, that will be the end of the story. Yeah. So it is upon young people to bring this positive change. Yeah, and, and I think and that is why it is really timely that we are having this conversation about civic education. Because the difference between marginalization of young people and their empowerment is literally civic education. Yes. Until they understand that they have a lot of power that they wield, then we will be in this temporary state of marginalization. They say a gun is only as useful as its bullets. Because then a gun without a bullet, um, a rung will be more useful. So then what is happening what has started happening, what is happening, and what will happen towards 2027 is young people loading their bullets. Mm. Yes. And we hope we are in agreement. Correctly. Yeah. <laughs> mm, yeah. So in 2027, youth, please, talk in vote. Yeah. And yeah. it starts from taking those ID cards. That should be mm. the conversation now. Yeah. Because 2027 will, will come. Uh, and you, there are no identity cards with the young people. The bullets have not yet been cocked in the guns. It will be just, it will mm. just be makelele, makelele. You've used mm. hot air. Yeah, I've not Chasing used it. Chasing a wild goose. <laughs> okay. Um, so as we wind up, what message would you like to leave with the young people uh, who are just beginning this nini kujijua mm, and kujua their, nini, their role in the society? <laughs> 
Uh, on this one, I'm going to talk to the hearts of young people and tell you as young people, there's a lot of hope in this country. This country is one of the best countries to be in. And it is our responsibility as young people. And when I say our, I mean us included. Because you can see I also don't have white hair. I'm still a, I'm still a young person who has a lot of hope for this country. But this hope can only be cemented if you take your space. If you look at the generations that have been before you, if you look at your, the, your grandfather's generation, their calling was simple, to fight for the independence of this country and make sure that we have the liberties that we are enjoying today. That was their generational struggle, and they won that struggle. Come to your parents, and their generational struggle was the fight for expanded civic space where they were fighting for the second liberation, they were fighting for a new constitution, they were fighting for good governance, and they rose to the occasion. And actually, they were able to give this uh, country a multi-party democracy, and they were also able to give ourselves a very progressive constitution. Each generation has its battle. And your generation right now is to make sure that the governance of this country is, 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 uh, is put in order. The responsibility you have is to make sure that the leaders are held accountable. The responsibility that you have is to uh, make sure that the younger generation who are ge gen generation alpha that is behind you, your younger siblings, find a country that they would be very proud to be in. So wherever you are, know that it starts with you as a person. What are you doing to make sure that civic education is being passed on to, the, to, to your colleagues? Mkiwa hapo base ya jaba, mkiwa kwa club, mkiwa kwa place ya pool, mkiwa in all the spaces. Talk about civic education. Talk about issues that affect the country. Be patriotic citizens because if this country were to take the trajectory that it was taking before the Gen Z movement, we will not be having a country to talk about. So Gen Z, we are behind you. Young people, we are behind you. And as millennials, we are saying... Uh, fix what we were not able to fix and we are behind you and we are going to support the young people. We are going to be having Bunge Mashinani concerts for civic education every last Sunday and we are starting in Kiambu County. Come and let us talk about civic education. Come to these spaces. We are coming to your spaces where we will dance 90%, 10% civic education. This 10% is what is, what is going to change this country. So uh, we really appreciate the, the young people of this country. And uh, we thank uh, the Youth Cafe for having these spaces because these are spaces that really matter for young people that are going to save this country. And it is a, a very big space. And we also want to ally us with them to be in the streets where we can also have these conversations. Thank you very much, Charlie, for having us. You're welcome. Um, my parting shot would be democracy, unfortunately, unfortunately, gives you the leaders that you deserve and the leaders that are a reflection of our society. And the leaders that we have, we can all agree, are really corrupt. That means our society is really corrupt. So then the fundamental problem with what we are facing right now is integrity. So I want to call every young person and every Kenyan to integrity. Mm -hmm. um, the second thing is I want my fellow youth um, to understand that we can't afford to go back to being apathetic towards political <coughs> process and governance processes. Um, we can't go back to, you know, giving up and letting the political class and the political elite govern us without us taking part in that governance. And that is why we have public participation. So I want to challenge them to access information. We're in a generation where we cannot cry foul when mm -hmm. it comes to information. Only a click of the button away and you have... Um, an auditor's report on your county. So then have you looked at how NGCDF has been utilized by your area MP? Have you looked at how your governor has spent um, he, his money in, in his second year in office? So I want to challenge them to do that. I want to challenge them to do more um, than just digital activism. Um, mm -hmm. Register um, <coughs> for voting if you don't have an ID. Register for one. Um, take your voters card, um, make change in 2027. Um, kwa wenzangu wa taita, um, there is still a lot of work to be done. 
Um, na hatutakata tamaa heri kukata kiuno kuliko kata tamaa. Eh. Okay. <laughs> wow, beautiful beautiful insights. Um, I feel so challenged. Sai kungekuwa na nini ningekuwa number one kwa line ya voting. <laughs> Yeah, um, so before we sign off, our listeners might want to connect with you. Uh, would you please share your social media handles? Um, yeah, you can go. Please. Yeah, ours is uh, simple, you know, across all uh, social media. It's at Bunge Machinani for all the social media platforms. You can find us there, link with us, follow us, and on the streets, please come and join us as we engage. Uh, how about your personal Um, in Facebook, uh, Michael Kimburu. In other socio- uh, socials, it's uh, Samburu. Yeah, um, I I volunteer with an organization called Taifa Teule and Shiriki. So in all sh- socials, um, at Taifa Teule Network, um, um, at Shiriki two five four, Instagram, TikTok, Twitter, um, Facebook, you name it. Uh, my personal socials at Mwamburi B O. Yeah. Mm. Wow. Um so thank you so much for heeding to our call and giving your very powerful insights. Uh your contributions have not only enlightened us but they have also inspired us to take action actually. So we really look forward to um, continuing this conversation and driving change together. Well, yeah. Thank you for having us. You're welcome. You. Uh, to our technical team, thank you so much for coming through and to our people Asante Nisana for sticking with us to the end. Uh, please subscribe to our channel, like, share, and comment on the topics you'd like us to discuss about and the guests you'd like us to bring on board. Until the next one, bye!